It's Passover time. Part of Holy Week and Jesus decides to be with his disciples. He says to them, go to the small town and let's prepare for Passover. In Luke's gospel, the 22nd chapter and the 14th verse, he says, when the hour had come, he sat down with the 12 apostles with him. And he said to them with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer. For I say to you, 
I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And as he took the cup, he gave thanks. Take this and divide it amongst yourself, he said. And then he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He went on to say, and as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Father, this Easter season, we look at the bread differently. Your broken body, broken for us. The piercings for us. The thorn on your head for us. The way you had to endure it in front of all those people for us. Father, we thank you. And as we take this bread, we remember you as you have asked us to. Let's eat together. Likewise, Jesus took the cup. And after he took the cup, he said, this is cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. As often as you come together to drink, do this also in remembrance of me. This particular time when Jesus implemented the communion with his apostles was not such a great time because of the betrayal that was coming his way. Jesus still was forgiving then, he's still forgiving now. This blood is the new covenant. He gives it for us, he said it washes us white as snow. He says it's for the purification of our bodies, it's for the healing that we need, it's for the deliverance that we need. It covers everything we do, his blood. Father, we thank you for it now. Let's drink together. God, we do that in remembrance of you. Amen. How great the castle that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadow of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Oh, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken. 
broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope yeah. then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion. Bethel. I welcome you to our Good Friday service. Thank you so much for the worship we just had and I hope it, it filled your heart, made you feel that you were part of something bigger than yourself and you're preparing yourself for our Good Friday event. What I've done, I've decided that we would this year have our five pastors be a part of this to walk us through Holy Week from the triumphal entry to his resurrection. I've asked them to take their time and just, just expound on it just a little bit in storytelling fashion to where you would be a part of it. Connect the dots, if you will. What happened on this day? What happened on that day? What happened at this time? What happened that time? What was the ending time? And as they put it together, find yourself seeing how Jesus came and gave his life for us how he came and gave all that he had as a sinless babe all through his life. In his 33 plus years here on this earth, he gave of himself. And at the very end of it, he gave the very ultimate. But he said to us, in three days I'll rise. And surely he did. For a purpose, for a point, you'll get to see it tonight on Good Friday. Now, before we get started, let me share this with you. I know you hear the term Good Friday and on this Good Friday, our Savior is flogged, he's whipped, he's beaten. Our Savior is turned totally different. Our Savior is betrayed, our Savior has gone through quite a bit. 
This is a story worth not just reading, but remembering and putting into practice. Welcome tonight as you hear our pastor speak to you on our Good Friday service. I don't know how people got the news that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, but the police was packed. I am talking zero social distancing, okay? Shoulder to shoulder, side by side. Kids are stepping on each other's toes, climbing on their parents' shoulders in anticipation. Spontaneous worship and praise is just like rippling across the crowd. And they shouted a unique word, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Now. This word would have attracted a lot of attention. You might not know this, but it's actually a cry for help. It's um, a plea that means help, please save me. I beg of you, I plead you, please save us now. And these Jewish believers who are shouting this in Jerusalem were under the oppression of the Roman rule. They were awaiting the day that their Messiah would arrive and make them an independent country once again. So you know that the Roman soldiers who are occupying Jerusalem have a very heavy eye on this massive gathering. Their job was to enforce the rule of the Roman Empire, meaning that they were prepared to quash any rebellion that was started. But the Jewish leaders heard something different when they heard Hosanna. Shouting this word meant the crowd acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah. It meant that they knew he had the power to save. So now like Hosanna in the highest doesn't sound like a plea anymore. It doesn't sound like begging. It sounds like praise because they recognized they no longer needed to beg for help anymore because help is here. Hosanna in the highest. They were affirming salvation has arrived salvation has come it is here now there was no party planning committee behind this makeshift parade there were no parade floats or balloon arches or marching bands people literally took their own clothing and spread it over the ground and they went out and they cut branches off the palm trees and that's how they decorated the road finally the guest of honor arrives and I think it's safe to say that Jesus was not the Messiah anyone was expecting. They were expecting a king, a warrior, a man of great power and authority. This guy should be coming in here on like a stallion, you know, a chariot, an elephant, okay? But instead, he rode in on a donkey. The religious leaders were just shocked by his brazenness. That's exactly how the prophet Zechariah said the king would arrive. The soldiers were just probably scoffing at the silliness. That's their king, the guy on the donkey. That's their king. But the crowd was in awe of his humility. That's my king. Jesus was with his disciples, and it was approaching the time for the Passover meal. This is a time when all of Israel would come together and celebrate an event that happened in their history. Back in the time of Egypt, when the Israelites were in slavery, the Passover was when the angel of death would pass over their houses and if they had marked their door frames with the lamb's blood, the blood of the lamb, then they would be saved from their firstborn son being taken. So they were informed that they needed to prepare a meal that was going to be quick and easy to, uh, so they could be ready to leave the very next day, the very next morning. So they would make unleavened bread, bread that didn't have yeast in it, so it would be able to be made quickly 
and some other items are made for the meal as well. So this Passover meal, this Passover feast, is something that's celebrated and performed yearly so that they would be able to remember what happened. So the disciples were doing this Passover meal, and it was time uh, for this meal in Jerusalem. So Jesus sent his disciples ahead of him to prepare the meal, to prepare a place for them to have this meal. Little did they know that this would be the last Passover meal that they would be sharing with Jesus before he was to die on the cross. So they go in to have this meal together, and Jesus shares some words with them during this meal. This is found in Matthew's, or sorry, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, starting in verse 19. As they're sitting around the table, it says, And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. That would have been stunning for them to hear. And so they thought on that throughout the whole meal. And at the end of the meal, Jesus speaks again. And he says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So they have these things that they've been talking about and thinking about through the whole meal. And then he says, this cup is a new covenant in my blood things that they are meditating on and thinking on during this meal. After Jesus broke the bread and drank wine with the disciples, he said something that was going to kind of change the atmosphere from that supper. He said that among you, a friend, one is going to betray me. For it is written that the Son of Man must die. A little bit later, you'll see that Jesus went to the Mount of the Olives to pray. He's familiar with that as he went to kind of find some time with God. He told his disciples to stay and to pray so that they wouldn't go into temptation. And as he was praying and speaking with God, he said something that showed his humanity. He said that, God, if, if, if it's your will, can you take this from me? Can you take this cup from me? But then he said something. He said, but if it's your will, let that happen. Jesus knew what was to happen. But still, in his humanity, he was suffering. I could only imagine the weight of the world, the weight of sin for humanity, redemption and salvation for humanity, he was carrying. Later on, it says in scripture that the, the stress was so much, the, 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 the suffering and the spirit was so much that his sweat was like great drops of blood. But then God strengthened him. He came down. He saw the disciples were sleeping when he told them to, to pray. He said, listen, you need to pray so that you wouldn't fall into temptation. As they were there, a huge crowd approached them. And leading the crowd was Judas. One that was dining and having supper with him hours ago, now moves this crowd so that they could arrest Jesus. The disciples were just angry and they were like, let's fight. One of them even got a sword and cut one of the soldiers ear. But Jesus said, no, this is not the time for this. He took the ear, put it back on the shoulder and healed them. Jesus later on went to say something that I believe was going to mark his journey to the cross. He said, the power of darkness, this is now the time for the power of darkness to reign.
In the wee hours of the morning, after Jesus had been betrayed, the soldiers took him away. They took him to several courts with several hearings. He was tried. And during that time, the crowds were shouting and the crowds were mocking him. And Peter denied him during that time three times. Peter, one of his most beloved disciples. The crowds that had welcomed him into the city on what we now call Palm Sunday were now saying, crucify him, crucify him. Even when they were offered in exchange from Barabbas to for, for Jesus, they wanted Barabbas set free, who was a prisoner, a murderer. And Jesus, who was perfect, was to be crucified. They beat him. They placed a crown of thorns on his head. They spit on him. They mocked him. They hit him in the head. Then they placed a cross, a heavy wooden cross, on his wounded, torn skin and made him carry it to Golgotha, which means Skull Hill. On the way there, he was very weak. He was having a hard time making it. So they pulled Simon of Cyrene out of the crowd and said, you carry the cross. And Jesus, along with two thieves who were to be crucified the same day, were taken up to Skull Hill, where at nine o'clock in the morning, they were placed on the cross, nailed to the crosses, and lifted to stand tall. People continued to mock him. And during that time, Jesus didn't say much. A few words here and there. But then at noon, it suddenly went completely dark. And Jesus said, into your hands I commend myself. It is finished. And he died. He took his last breath. And after that, they took him down off the cross. They buried him in a borrowed tomb and placed him there with a stone across the front and guards watching it as Mary, his mother, and Mary Magdalene watched. As early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake when an angel had come down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The angel spoke to the woman. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He's risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. For a moment this morning, I want to draw your attention to the words, as a new day was dawning. I realize that Matthew was talking about a normal day, but I believe this day was anything but normal. On this day, everything changed. On this day, God validated everything Jesus ever said, every miracle he performed, and most importantly, his claim to be the promised Messiah who had come into the world to save it. On this day, Jesus conquered death, hell, the grave, and made available eternal life to everyone who would put their trust in him. I have one verse of scripture I'd like to draw your attention to. It's found in Romans 1, verse 4, which validates the life of Jesus. It says this, and he was shown to be the son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit 
Let me read it one more time. He was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? It means that Jesus was not an ethical teacher, nor was he a prophet. It means that Jesus was God's Son sent by God to reconcile the world back to himself. And that includes you. So on this Sunday, cry out to God to be merciful to you and become part of his family. So don't forget, God is real, Jesus is alive, and the Holy Spirit is working among us. Amen. So what do you think? What did you think when you heard about the triumphal entry? What did you think when you heard about the stories of how they had the Last Supper? What did you think about the betrayal? What did you think about his passion? What did you think about the resurrection? I want to share this little short bit from you, and it's going to help you out of Luke's Gospel, the 24th chapter, and it, and it's... This heading on this chapter is the disciples' eyes would open. Then they drew near to a village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to say to them, to stay with them. Now it had come to pass, as he sat at the table with them, then he broke bread, blessed it, and broke it again, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they knew him. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? These two disciples were on their road of the Emmaus, and they were encountered by Jesus. He came to see them. He, it was the resurrected one, and their hearts burned from it. What is your heart burning now to say as you hear the story? And many of you have time and time on your side to where you've heard the Easter story over and over again, and you've seen it. Still, your heart should burn. It should burn to know that, you know, Jesus gave his life for us. And out of, out of Hebrews chapter 12, it says this. At the very end of it, it said, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and had sat down at the right hand on the throne of God. The same Jesus who was resurrected is still our resurrected Savior today. The same Jesus who came and gave it all is still giving it all for you. He told us, listen, I can't go. If I don't, the comforter won't come. We have the Holy Spirit that is with us to help us through these times that we're in. Now, on this Good Friday, as you look at how Jesus gave his life for us and you read the Gospels and you find out who Jesus is for yourself, let me share with you right now what I'm feeling. I'm feeling that God really has a desire for every single one of us to know his story, to know all about him, to know that he said, I go before you to prepare a place for you, to know that he said before us, do this, all these things you do, because you'll remember me when I break bread with you, when we have communion. You'll remember me as we sit down together and we talk. Has Jesus been a part of your life? Has Jesus made you feel that you, you accepted him as one of the best things you could ever do? I speak to you right now, maybe a little salvation message, and just says to you, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says emphatically, if you will confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, that's it. He said you'll be saved. You'll be saved. You turn from those things that you're going into now and you make new ways. You find someone to disciple you. You find someone to tell you the story, and your heart too can burn. You can see and feel what he did for us. I want to thank Jesus personally for him being in my life. I want to thank Jesus personally if he's in your life. 
because he's done so much for us to bless us, to keep us, and to watch over us. That Good Friday was not so good. That Good Friday was treacherous. He lost a friend. He lost people that really that were shouting for him one week, crucifying him within the next five days. He was beaten. He bled. He looked on that cross in between two common thieves, gave his life, asked God to forgive us for all our sins. We could not have given our sins away like that. Only Jesus had to come and be the sacrifice we needed for the sins that we have. I pray you have a wonderful Easter. Remember the story of Jesus and know this. He loves you. He said so. He left us with this message. Go make disciples. That's what we should do. Go and make disciples. And he told us at the very end of that scripture, and I'll be with you always. Let's believe that. Let me pray for you. God, I indeed thank you for this service, this Good Friday service. The pomp and circumstances that go with it, from the satyrs to the prayer to the communions to the, to the outside events to the flowers to all the things that happen, the Easter lilies, they're all part of it. But none of it matters as much as you being in our lives. I pray right now for a blessing upon every person here that our Easter will be manifest told of how good it is each and every year to remember Christ our Savior who died on the cross as the prophet Joel told us as Ezekiel told us as we were, were mentioned throughout the Bible even as far back as Genesis that you will soon crush the head of Satan you're our victor you're our redeeming king and we love you and we thank you so much for the opportunity to come here and celebrate Good Friday Amen May the Lord bless you and keep you on behalf of Bethel. Amen.